Every Tuesday morning, and you guys might not know this, but Heritage and Philippi, we uh, we teach the same passage, and we typically get together to discuss how we're going to preach that passage. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about that is that we're doing exposition in community, which means that we um, we figure out what the point of the passage is together, and then we talk about how we can preach it. And then two different people preach it at two different churches, and it's really cool. So what we thought would be fun to do is to actually film that, to record that, and uh, share that with anybody that would want to listen. So uh, kind of see how the sausage is made kind of thing. Uh, what does that look like to actually build and think about what a sermon, uh, how, how a sermon can come into, come into shape? So I'm here at uh, the Hive Studios uh, with Pastor Paul. Um, pastor Paul is the lead pastor at Heritage. And here with Jeremy Neff, who is associate pastor um, slash guru of all things, including backpacking. Um <laughs> and many other things, uh, at Heritage, and Kathy, the Women's Ministry Director at Heritage, and my name's Sam, and I'm uh, the pastor at Philippi Church. So that's the crew, that's who we are, and then at some point, we're going to be subbing out uh, Mitch, and he'll come in and, and take over, because we only had four microphones, so <laughs> church plant, what are you going to do? Okay, <laughs> we'll get five someday. Anyways, so we're going to pray, and Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you, Sounds and good. if you want to lead us through this. Yeah. Oh, Father, we ask that you just be with us today, God, as we open up your word, as uh, God, as we, as we pour over this text, God, would you just lead this discussion? God, give us eyes to see the things that we need to see. God, get us out of the way. And God, help us, help us see what the intent of this text is and how it is you've called us to, to not only hear it and understand it, but God, to teach it to your people. So God, we ask your blessing over the study. Mm -hmm. Be glorified in it and through it. And God, we pray that in the pulpit this coming Sunday at, uh, at Heritage and at Philip, I, God, that you be glorified through the preaching of your word, that eyes would be opened and you would be worshiped. God, we love you. We invite you into this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the text for this week is... Mark chapter 4, we're, we're preaching verses 1 through 35, and so why don't we just go ahead and read the entire fourth chapter of Mark, uh, and then uh, we'll read it uh, together, and then uh, we'll just kind of start discussing afterwards, like Perfect. each week. Sound Sounds good? good. <clears throat> All right, I'll start. We can just kind of run this way. We'll go a paragraph at a time. Sound good? Mark 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seeds fell among them, among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell unto good soil, and it produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you it has been given to you has been given the, the secret of the kingdom of God but for those outside everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive they may indeed indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven and he said to them do you not understand this parable how then will you understand all the parables the sower sows the word and these are the ones among the path where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they had no root in themselves, but endure for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, 
Is a lamp brought in to be put under a bush or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use. It will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has more, to, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the, in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with, that, we, er, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is grown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in it in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them with a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side, and we can stop there. That's where the, the preaching text is going to end this week. All right, big swath. A lot of scripture, a lot going on, uh, a lot of movement, some unique structural features. Uh, first pass through. Uh, I know we all studied this outside of this this reading, but so what stands out to you? What, what, what did you guys see in today in this read through that's unique, different, catches your eye? I think for me, first of all, you know, I've taught this before, but I've only, I've, I've taught the four seeds part, mm -hmm. right? The four yeah. soils, uh, one seed, four soils. And so I've always isolated that. And I think what was challenging for me this morning as I was interacting with this was how do I fit that into this bigger section that includes these other parables? And what it was forcing me to do was ask a question of like, what's the, what's the bigger purpose behind these parables? Mark kind of groups them together uh, for, for a reason. And, and what is that? And uh, it, it, was, it was challenging to, to think through. Yeah, so what are, what are the commonalities? Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I noticed a difference just translationally. You, you said bush. Uh, my, my, um, my translation says that you put a candle, if you can't put a candle under a basket. Oh. And, uh, and I think probably there's some reasons mm -hmm. for that, but uh, it was interesting hearing just a different phrasing. Yeah. What do you have, Kathy, the, the Book of Mormon? <coughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> of course, I learned that from you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. I mean, kidding. whatever your truth is. <laughs> <clears throat> I actually was really struck this time reading through it by the fact um, that there's so much emphasis on hearing. Yeah. And so I kept think, thinking about the word, word of hear, hear, and there's purpose why God, why Jesus is using those words, and that there's also then uh, emphasis on response. So there's, mm -hmm. there's the hearing of the word, and then how do we respond to it? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I was reading this morning again through the text, same thing, you know, three different times he, he yeah. talks about he who has ears, let him mm -hmm. hear. And I was reminded of what the mission of Jesus was, Mark 1, you know, 14 and 15, he came to proclaim the good news, came to yeah. proclaim the gospel and the proclamation is received by the hear, by hearing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's interesting, this, this language again around hearing and then yes. how does that interplay with these parables? Like mm -hmm. what is, what are these parables <coughs> illustrating about the desire to hear, the ability to hear, the want to hear versus the yes. hardening of the heart and the deafening yeah. of the ears. And I'm trying to figure that whole play mm -hmm. out as I read through yeah. all these parables. I was thinking this morning as I was reading this, that it's almost like Jesus is pulling us up above the weeds of all of the different stories that we've mm -hmm. seen. Cause we've, he's, he's kind of led us to see the crowds. We have the, the outer circle of disciples with the inner circle of disciples. Last week we looked at, you know, the, the appointing of the apostles. Um, so he's juxtaposing the crowds with the inner circle, people in the house versus people outside the house, if you will. And <clears throat> there's probably a little bit of confusion for the reader as to why is there's this mixed emotion as mm -hmm. to the receiving of the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom's breaking in like the wineskin. It's expanding, it's growing. Um, and everyone has a different kind of response to that. Some people are, uh, as we just looked at a, few, a couple weeks ago, they're plotting to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. Others are still not sure. They're still kind of wanting to see other miracles. And then others have become part of his inner core and inner following. And so 
with these parables for me, it's almost like Jesus is pulling us up with like a drone footage and saying, here's the big picture of what's going on. The reason there's a, a mixed bag of responses is because there's four different kinds of soil. And in, in, in each of these parables, it illuminates kind of a big picture reality of, of the, the purpose and the distinctions of the kingdom of Christ, which is really fascinating. That's for me what tied it all together. Mm -hmm. Jesus is kind of peeling the curtain back for his disciples who want to know the truth uh, of what the kingdom really is doing here and why it's having this mixed reception. Yeah, I wonder if you were to look back at the, you know, the three chapters leading up to this. And if we were to look at the different interactions with Christ that we've seen up to this point, how they would identify, how we would categorize them under these different types of soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether they got the Pharisees or the crowds mm -hmm. or whomever else. Right. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think that ties in really well even with the, the, the passage previous to this, which is on <coughs> the subject of blaspheming the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. And Jesus is, is saying, listen, to the, to the Pharisees that are there, uh, you know what is being revealed here by the Holy Spirit. And you're choosing, rather than to receive that, you're choosing to deny that. You're, you're cutting yourself off from the only hope of repentance that you have by denying the truth that's been revealed to you. And then right after that, it goes right into these parables about how you hear the word of God and what takes place in the heart there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very clear tie in between those two. Totally. Yeah, it opens a bigger can of worms, too, that, that uh, we have to think through, and that is how do we interpret parables hermeneutically, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a lot of different approaches, um, and I think it's important to distinguish the difference between an allegory mm -hmm. and, an, and a parable. You know, an allegory, every single little bit of it is meant to represent something else. Um, in a parable, there might be some allegorical features, mm -hmm. but a parable is usually meant to make a point, a general point, and you're, and you're not necessarily supposed to read into every little detail, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the point Jesus is getting at in the first parable, it seems, is is the importance of the quality of the soil, right? Mm -hmm. Whether whether or not you um, receive and hear, and then he goes on to make that very clear as he explains it to to the disciples. You know, for those that want to hear, they'll be given more. Mm -hmm. For those that don't want to hear, then it's it's judgment on them you know mm -hmm. in that in that way and so it's you know maybe that's something to kick around a little bit too is how how do we interpret parables this is the first time i think we've hit par parables in the book in the book of mark am i right well we've had the wine and the wine oh skins. the wine and the wine skins you're right you're right um which you know similarly what was jesus point with the wine and the wine skins it was kind of one point right, right. like there's yeah. there's this new administration coming in and the bureaucracy <coughs> isn't going to be able to handle it the mm -hmm. establishment it's incompatible so there was kind of one point there mm -hmm. um in each of these parables to me it's it's saying almost a very singular point about the kingdom of god um and the specifics of it mm -hmm. it seems like the the four seeds though is supposed to inform the others mm -hmm. it seems like the mark's piling those on and putting them um, after that because they're related to it in some way. And I think that's kind of one thing we need to figure out what that is. And I think if you, if you look at the, the parables that came before this, there's, there's, some, there's a different, I think there's a shift in the way in which, well, the, 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 the teaching of Jesus through parables kind of takes a shift here in chapter four of Mark. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if even like the wineskins, the, they're, they're metaphorical, they're more easy to understand. Mm -hmm. There's a purposeful masking that's taking place mm -hmm. in, the, in the teaching of parables. And we see that here was versus uh, um, that little kind of insertion yeah, in the, verse 12. Yeah, verse 12, uh, 10, through, 10 through 12 here. And that's, you know, we talked last week about the Mark and Sandwich mm -hmm. that took place between the, the, the family of Jesus, <coughs> you know, wanting to pull him back into, to, to, Nazareth, and then the insertion in the middle of that with, with the interaction he had with the scribes here in the first twenty verses of Mark. It's another one of those of Mark chapter four. It's another one of those those parabolic sandwiches. He's like he's got the soil, soil on either end, and in the middle there's this unique insertion where he's giving us some unique insight into what his purpose is for the parables. Enough, it's, it's been disagreed upon obviously by lots of people over the years as they've tried to interpret this text. But what does that say? What are those? What's what's t what's ten through twelve? How does it inform the way we ought to think of the rest of the parables that we see? Mm -hmm. I read one thing, you know, the word secret there, uh, the, the Greek is mysterion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really kind of what is the, the wrestling match here is, is why is Jesus mm -hmm. being so secretive, right? Mm -hmm. Why isn't he just coming out with clarity on what, um, on what he's trying to say? And then he quotes this Isaiah passage, which when you go back and look at that, um, it informs it a little bit. So the Isaiah passage is God basically condemning Northern Israel for their um, unwillingness to hear and uh, and then subsequently they become judged under the Assyrian army um, uh, when Assyria deports the northern tribes of Israel uh, because they didn't want to hear. They're not hearing because they didn't want to hear. And so 
there's a reason that 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 Jesus is deploying that that passage, and I think it's because I think he's he's trying to say there's a similar thing happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, the Son of God, God's word, God's final word, is literally physically here. Uh, empowered by the spirit, showing the miraculous. Um, like how Sam Storm says, like the miracles are, are uh, the testimony of heaven. I mean, it's, the, it's mm-hmm. the, the credential of heaven is how he, he says it. And you are not even wanting to listen. Mm-hmm. And so he is speaking in, in riddles in, in, such a, in such a way to see if they actually want to know the truth. Um, he wants them to chew on it. He doesn't want to just give it to him, serve it up so easy um, that, you know, he wants to know who really wants to know. Mm-hmm. And he gives special knowledge to his inner circle because his inner circle is the one that really wants to know the truth, yeah. you know? So that, I think that Isaiah quote really gives a little bit of context. And I, and I think like Jesus does often, he's saying we're in a similar time uh, that we were in, in the time of Isaiah when, mm-hmm. when Israel was apostate, they're apostate again, the religious mm-hmm. institution of Israel is unwilling and too rigid to hear the truth when it comes. And he's almost kind of saying, what about you? Mm-hmm. Are you too rigid to hear the truth? Are you going to be a wineskin that can contain the realities of the kingdom? Mm-hmm. Yeah, even the way that our passage today uh, ends up, Jesus spoke in parables, but then he explains to his mm-hmm. disciples later, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think there's a purpose in that, in, in that Jesus is saying, those that really want to hear, they draw close. Those that value the kingdom, they're the ones that like press into it and they really want to understand other people just go, Oh, you know, it's just dismissed by them very, very easily because their heart already is not inclined Mm -hmm. to wanting to know what truth is uh, in in the first place. Right. And he goes on to say then for, to the one who has more will be given. Mm -hmm. Like he's emphasizing that Mm -hmm. there in that portion of scripture. And I love the way he says to pay attention to what you hear. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it's he, he's putting an emphasis on that very thing that the the ones who are hearing more will be given. Mm-hmm. So it is a matter of the heart. It always comes down to a, yep. be a, a matter of the heart, and you see that all the way through the scripture. I think it's interesting. Also in Luke's gospel, uh, the phrasing is changed just a little bit mm-hmm. in the parallel passage because he says not only what you hear but how you hear. Uh-huh. Pay attention to how you hear, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so there's this like studiousness to the heart yeah. that it is a component to that, both hearing an accurate message, but then yeah. how you receive that, how you interact with that truth right. uh, becomes ultimately yeah. all important. Right. Yeah. I, I really am thankful for verse 21 through 25, the idea of the lamp under the basket. Cause I think mm. the point of that, and again, I haven't spent a ton of time yeah. on this is what this, this is about. Um, but you know, it seems like the point is, is that the gospel will be, understood by by many and even though right now it's veiled israel is in this sort of stage of of rejection in in, in jesus's presence there's coming uh the breaking out of the holy spirit and of the gospel at pentecost which then will go to the world and so he's saying truth you know truth is going to come out at some point the light was made to be seen Mm -hmm. and even though it's Mm -hmm. being veiled right now uh there's going to come a time when jesus ascends sends the spirit where the light will burst out Mm -hmm. and that's kind of cool because because if you really just read this you know verse 10 through 12 it kind of feels a little cruel like jesus you're saying like you don't want people to understand i thought we were evangelists i Mm -hmm. thought we were evangelicals i thought we want people to come to know the truth Jesus understands there's a, a time coming where the truth will be understood. And you see the, the second Jesus breathes his last, mm. uh, the, was it the centurion? Uh, yeah. All of a sudden has this knowledge mm. about who the son of man, the son of God was. And what mm. happened in that moment? It wasn't just that we got access to the, the Holy of Holies. It's that the Holy of Holies broke out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The veil was torn and God's spirit is now out throughout the world. And the gospel is breaking mm-hmm. in throughout all the world. So it's kind of has a hopeful tone. Like Jesus is like, yeah, right now you don't know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But you know, Jesus was, he was just, he was just kind of preparing the way for the apostles to really clean up and to really come yeah. back through, rethread the needle. And when the, the gospel went out, um, people didn't really understand mm-hmm. and the spirit and the spirit through the apostles brought those things into light. Yeah. So there's a hopeful tone, I think in there too, with that parable. You ever wonder what it was like <clears throat> for the apostles after the outpouring of the spirit as they're gathered to the early church, going back and walking through the ministry of Jesus and remembering parables and being like, Oh yeah, dude! Oh, oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh, how'd we miss that? Do you ever think about that as you're working yeah. back through totally. all their experiences, yeah. like and having that the hindsight 2020 thing going on in their life? Yeah. Well, yeah. You listen to John, and he's like, you know, th- there's not enough libraries in the world to contain all the yeah. things that Jesus yeah. did. So they're going back and they're yeah. picking sort of the highlights reel of their experience and their encounter with Jesus. These are all the things that like 
rise to the surface, exactly. you know, in their in their hearts and minds. Yeah. And these other parables really, really make sense when you think about the book of Acts. Yeah. You got this one, this parable here in verse 26 of, you know, the guy goes to bed and wakes up the next morning and boom, there's fruit, <laughs> there's life, you know. So uh, Jesus himself is just is just dealing with radical unbelief mm-hmm. and, and radical um, uh, opposition to the point of them putting him on the cross. But then at Pentecost, the disciples, these, these boneheads, all of a sudden have exponential growth and it's like one in one day the church grows to 5,000 or whatever and then it's just from there it's just an unstoppable machine the gospel moving throughout all the nations um who did that was it was it people or was it the spirit of god yeah. he's like the, the kingdom's gonna grow yeah. the truth is gonna come out uh your job is to cast the seed yeah. but at the end of the day it's not synthetic it's mm-hmm. organic god's gonna do the work and that's really encouraging and then the other parable too there the mustard seed Jesus yeah. is like, hey, I know this feels ragtag right now. I know this feels like me and a couple of <laughs> random people, but man, just wait 50 years. Yeah. Right. This thing's going to grow. And and he's, I think he's beckoning back to the book of Daniel there, mm-hmm. the idea of the plant growing up into this ecosystem, mm-hmm. that Jesus' kingdom is going to literally become its own climate mm-hmm. in which people will be blessed by, mm-hmm. that the covenant people of Christ now create our own counterculture right. with Jesus as our head and Jesus picks that up in John 15 when he talks about the vine and the branches and mm. we're part of him as this this new vine of Israel it's really kind of exciting when you think about it through the book of Acts totally yeah I love the word picture there too it's just so it's very visual for me uh, the idea of a lamp being hid under a bed or under a basket you know they have oil lamps right and uh, so there's a live flame that is is flickering and if you stick a, a live flame underneath a bed made of straw Oof. or underneath of a basket like yeah. whatever <laughs> is underneath of it it's mm-hmm. it's going to be yeah. revealed through and it's going to be a big revealing mm-hmm. <laughs> right yeah. this idea that it's like inflammatory it's going to it's going to be yeah. this huge revealing wow mm-hmm. and think about what happened <clears throat> when they killed Jesus it made it worse, oh, sure. right? right? They're like, yes. stick that stick that candle under a bed, like <laughs> kill that guy, right? And then his death leads to the yeah. redemption of humanity yeah. and leads to the sending of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. Now now they got a resurrection to deny. Now they don't yeah. just have a, walk, a rabbi walking around. They have a resurrected Lord they have to figure out mm. what to do with. I mean, it, totally. it, it caught on fire. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, where's yeah. that? Where's the teaching <clears throat> where a seed must die and go into the ground in order for life to come? Yeah, Jesus gave that in John 15 ish. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the New Testament. <laughs> <said somewhere. laughs> Thanks, man. Well, it's, so you look at all these all these parables, right? So yeah. so they're they're agrarian, except for the, the parable about the lamp. Right. But everything else is seed, 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 mm-hmm. seed, seed. And then here in the middle we got this unique departure from the agrarian illustration and there's this and there's this teaching or this parable mm-hmm. on lamp. Do we do anything with that? I mean, did Mark group these parables in this order for this reason? Did he sandwich the parable about light? And then he's got those two unique things in mm-hmm. verse 23 and 24. If anyone has ears, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. There seems like this big emphasis in that mm-hmm. central parable in the middle of all these parables about seed. Is that just, is there a reason? Is there an organ? Is there, are there, is there a reason that Mark organized these in this way? It seems to me at least like it, that's the application. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, the seed is being scattered different hearts that it's being scattered in and and the soils are analogous to uh, the condition of the heart and or the competing values within the heart and and jesus is saying hey this is not a message that is just meant to be an exercise mentally this is something that you're supposed to share just like a, a light is meant to be put on a lampstand and light up the room you're supposed to receive this and you're supposed to give this out and if you don't give it out what you have will be taken away from you because mm-hmm. it just lies fallow. It, it's not producing <clears throat> anything. But if you if you take it and you share it, it actually multiplies. It's exponential um, as, as you share it because more seeds continue to go out. Just like the in the parable of the soils, in the, the fruitful soil, it produces more seeds. What's the point mm-hmm. of having more seeds? Well, to continue to propagate a, a further crop. Sure. Yeah, that's the only one that does. <coughs> right. Yeah, the other the other three examples obviously end in death. And he says in verse thirteen, he says, Do not do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So in in a sense indicating that it, this one is so important for you to understand because everything else is applicable. Mm. I mean it's applicable to everything else that he's you know, the parables that he's gonna share. At least that's the way I understood that as I read that. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I think there's truth to that. I also think there's a sense where Mark is kind of like giving us a sample 
mm-hmm. of a typical mm-hmm. Jesus sermon, mm-hmm. <laughs> typical Jesus teaching. Mm-hmm. He's obviously grouping these together for a reason. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a similarity there. Yeah. But I also think it's kind of like he probably told parables like this a lot. Yeah. And uh, and there's um, I do think the light one is at the heart of it. I think the chiastic structure maybe, you know, is pointing to that. But I think at the end of the day, too, Mark's just kind of like, hey, here's the, here's what I mean. Mm-hmm. Here's what he means when he talks about parables. Here was a lot of them, but I do. It does seem like the parables always seem to have this kingdom, yeah. um, mm-hmm. kingdom element. It's mm-hmm. it's the point is he's trying to explain what the inbreaking of his kingdom is going to look like, mm-hmm. um, and and there's that piece in there about harvest too. Yeah. You know, it's at which there's an eschatological element of that where yes, every time some a soul comes to Christ, there's a harvest, but there's also the fact that like judgment is right. coming and and, and a the final w- harvest another yeah. parable jesus gives elsewhere is the wheat and the tares i mean this somebody comes in in the middle of the night and sows wheat and yeah. sows tares and what do we do do we separate them out nope let them all grow up at the same time mm-hmm. once they grow up it'll be evident which is which and then you can harvest the fruit and the, where do the tares go yeah you know uh so anyways we yeah. need to see that I was going to say, we needed a farm. I mean, honestly, if you think about what if a parable, you were talking about parables earlier, Jeremy. Mm. And what Dave Hansen says is a, a parable most fundamentally is a known thing that's intended to give us understanding of an unknown thing. That's the function of a parable. It'd be great to have, uh, I mean, obviously everybody in first century understood these agricultural par- these right. all agricultural illustrations. It'd be great to have a farmer at the table <laughs> right now to kind of give a little insight yeah. as we unpack some of the seed stuff. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you, Jeremy. Oh, no, I, I, I was just going to go back and comment on the, the lamp under the basket piece. In verses 24 and 25, he says, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you, mm-hmm. and still more will be added. Yeah. For to one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so you see kind of like the this Jesus is, I think, pointing to um, the use of the knowledge that you receive, what is revealed to you, what is what mm. is given to you, is mm. meant to be used in some way. And, and if it if it lies fallow, if it's not being used, mm. man, uh, there there's a a direct consequence. And I, I can tell you this from my own life. I, I think personally, uh, in seasons where I'm taking in lots of information and I, and it has no outlet, I'm not giving out, I'm not sharing it. It, it actually becomes life um, killing spiritually for me. Mm. I, I like glut with information mm-hmm. and, and I lose my appetite even, I think, for the word of God. But in seasons where I'm giving out a lot, where what is being given to me is being shared and put on the lampstand with others, man, there there's a fruitfulness that comes with it. I see God multiplying uh, his labor in my life. I, I see him utilizing those truths in, in really profound ways. And, and so I think there's a spiritual principle yeah. there too. Yeah. Uh, this, and that has direct applications for, for mm-hmm. the disciples in this passage. I remember, I think I've shared this story with you before, Jeremy. I remember years and years ago, I was chatting with a, a pastor and, and we were in a church and, and some of the, the complaints of the people of the church were, um, man, we want more meat. Mm. We want we want deeper teaching, and I and I get that. I'm not saying they are wrong in even thinking that. But I remember when something he said it, it it stuck with me forever. He said, "You know, the most spiritual thing we can do is be obedient to the things we know." Yeah. And it's like to sit and gather information, gather mm-hmm. sit yes. under sound teaching year after year after year, but have a life that's devoid of mission. Mm-hmm. To have a, a life that's devoid of Christ likeness, yep. but you've got load storehouses of knowledge in your head. Like that's exactly what he's warning mm-hmm. against here. Like, what are you going to do with what you've yeah. heard? Yeah. That reminds me of that. Uh, Mark Twain quote. It's one of my one of my favorites. I mean, he was not a not a believer, but knowledgeable about the the scriptures. Uh, and he said, "It's not the things that I understand in the Bible that give me pause. It's the things that I. It's not the things I don't understand. It's the things I understand yeah. that trouble me so yeah. much." Yeah, yeah. And I think biblical knowledge is cumulative, and and it's it's amazing too, just how um, the more you read it, the more it makes sense, mm-hmm. and the more you want to hear from it, the more you hear from it. Totally. If you don't if you don't want the truth. It, you're not going to see it, yep. you know. Uh, you, you know, if if you are looking for the truth and you are reading and reading and it's 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 it stacks on top of each other, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think Jesus is wanting to give out more, yep. but he wants to know these guys yeah. want to know, and if they want to know, the parable in itself becomes a judgment on them, mm-hmm. right? You know, it mm-hmm. becomes a, it becomes sort of a tell, a, a revealer of mm-hmm. who is really interested in in this knowledge. Um, Jesus. Unab- unabashedly shares knowledge with those that, that believe in him. That's right. We saw that when his family shows up and he doesn't yep. give them access, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're like, hey, we're your family. He's like, who's my family? 
Mm-hmm. And as he's doing that, he's sitting teaching his true family, his disciples. And why are they his true family? Because they do what he says. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because they want to they want to live by his words. And that, mm-hmm. and so you know there really is an inner circle to the truth of Christ. And and that's a hard thing when you're trying to give answers to someone that has doubts, which it's it's normal to have doubts, you know. Yeah. But there comes a point where where if you don't have some measure of faith. You're never gonna. You're never gonna really break past that. Yeah. If you only ever come to Christ with your with being skeptical, mm-hmm. at some point there has to be a, a presupposition of okay, I tap, mm-hmm. now teach me. Otherwise, there's just a perpetual hardness of heart there, you know. Well, there, I think there's it's it's not a mistake as you pointed out a moment ago, Jeremy. It's not a mistake that the 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 teaching of parables comes right on the heels of the teaching of the of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, as these as these scribes were increasingly. <clears throat> hardening their hearts to the teachings of Jesus. And then he's like, okay, you don't want to know that I'm going to start teaching it away mm-hmm. where I'm just going to go ahead and give you over to that. And those who want to know can know. And those who don't want to know can just, yeah. you know, they can basically with their stubborn hearts and their unhearing hearts can heap judgment upon their own heads. Mm. So as we look at all this, obviously Mark wrote, uh, he wrote the, chapter four, there's organizing properties. There's a structure to what he's written here. He's assembled these different parables in this order that he's written it. And we have to teach 35 verses. I don't have to, Jeremy does and Sam does. I'm thankful I don't have to teach it. So structure wise, there's a structure here, right? This isn't just a bunch of words thrown on the side of a barn wall. There are, um, there's logical thought, there's organizing Mm -hmm. properties. As you looked at this text, as you tried to discern the structure, what did you guys see as some of the structure here uh, in these 35 verses? So I'm, uh, three different outlines that I was kind of working from. <laughs> okay, can I have one? Because I don't have <laughs> different ideas. Uh, but they all kind of fall into the same verse categories, <clears throat> yeah. which is the parable of the soils beforehand, and then the lampstand, and then the last two really focus on the harvest and, and um, sort of the final fruitfulness of, of the seeds of the kingdom. So uh, verses 1 through 20, casting kingdom seeds. Verses mm-hmm. 21 to 25, carrying the kingdom message. And verses 26 to 34, cultivating kingdom people. Uh, and an alternate to that, uh, using the, the, the focus on hearing. Uh, verses 1 through 20, hearing and the heart. Verses 21 to 25, hearing and sharing. And then uh, the last section there, hearing and growing, verses 26 to 34. So and those three categories, sowing, shining, mm. and then reaping kind of all stand out to me. <clears throat> uh, too bad there's not a word that means reaping that starts with S. <laughs> I know. I do love alliteration. That would be so sweet. You want to hear my outline? Uh, chapter one, or chapter four, verse one through nine, Jesus says some things about some stuff. And then <laughs> verse 10 through 35, Jesus says more things about some more stuff. <clears throat> That'll sure. preach. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a, you, know, you mentioned chiastic structure. Maybe it is. I haven't, I have not, I'm not spent enough time in the chapter to know, but I do think it's interesting that there is that departure from agrarian mm-hmm. illustra- uh, parables yeah. to that yeah. shining piece. Mm. I think there, I think that's, I think there's meant to be, I think that really helps us in understand the larger sex. Maybe right. I'm wrong, but that's, it, seem, it seems like you've touched on that, Jeremy, with your structure too. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy, what about you? Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I don't have a very good uh, uh, outline put out here, but the, the things that I, that thing that I saw that stuck, out really clearly to me was hearing responding and then sowing and then repeating Mm. so it's it's um it's pretty vague say that again hearing responding and then sowing in other words i was thinking in i was thinking in the light of discipleship yeah Mm -hmm. the work of discipleship so hearing responding sowing and then repeat then that is repeated Mm. over and over again that's good yeah I want to give a little bit of just for our audience, since we have the audience joining us this this week, and we don't normally. Um, there's you notice what we're doing here. We're not going immediately to application and saying, "What does this mean to me?" Yeah. Uh, we are asking the question, "What does this mean?" <coughs> what was the audience, or pardon me, what was the um, author's original intent in putting all this material in the same section? Um, what did it mean to its original audience? Does is there a structure we should be aware of? I mean, that's all work that needs to be done before you really get to the question of how does this apply to mm-hmm. me. Um, so I just want to point that out, yeah. just kind of give commentary really quick and say, you know, part of the reason we're doing this is we want to help people see how to study the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not that you have to do all this every time you wake up in the morning and do your devotions, but <laughs> yeah. um, but to be a good biblical student, you need to ask the questions of original intent, original audience, ethereal intent. What did the author mean uh, first? And so yeah. that's kind of what we're doing here. 
Yeah, so if what we do on Sunday is preaching or exposition, we don't just open up the Bible and start to exposit, right? Mm-hmm. We have to do some right. work. And so we're doing first exegesis. We're trying to expose what is there. We're trying to yep. see what the intent of the... So all this, what we're seeing here, this is the work of exegesis. Yep. And then, then you do that work of reflecting <clears throat> on the gospel. And then ultimately, we want it to become a homily or we want to do the work of right. homiletics, applying it to our people's lives. And so, yeah, it's really tempting. You're right, to just run mm-hmm. right to application. But we yeah. can miss some things. And we, we can just... Be, I think David Helm talks about it as impressionistic preaching. We can, we can mm-hmm. look at a text and say, oh, this one part of this large text impresses something on my heart. So I'm going to ignore everything else. <clears throat> I'm going to take that little nugget, that little shiny thing, and I'm going yeah. to teach on that on Sunday. So well, yeah. then we're depriving our people yeah. Right. Yeah. and we're not seeing the, the totality of what God has put here. Yeah. I was thinking about that on the, on the way over here, actually, how important this process is and, and how important it is for our people to see the work mm-hmm. because uh, we're, we're exemplifying even as we preach. It's like our, a training um, mm. model when we show our work and we show outline we under we we draw people into the text we're actually training on a sunday sermon how to read the bible mm-hmm. uh for in in private life as mm-hmm. well and I, I think man this whole process here is extremely important that's why i think outlines are so helpful to people because they <coughs> start to go okay i want to see what's in the text here and i want to see the logic of it and how it how it flows um, if it's disc, if our outlines or if what we preach on a Sunday morning is disconnected or is up above the text itself, then when they come back to it, they, they don't even understand how we got there in the first place. Exactly. Uh, so we're, we're training as we go through yeah, the scriptures. I agree. I it's important. And we're continuing to learn as ourselves, right? Yep. As we gather, I'm, I'm being sharpened by you guys. And it's like yeah, each amen. week, I feel like I'm learning uh, how, how to, and just having different perspectives. Cause you know, mm-hmm. whether we like it or not, we bring presupposition to the text yeah. yep. and we superimpose our thoughts on it. Then sure. all of a sudden Kathy's yeah. like, uh, guys, I'm like, Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. why it's so important to have Kathy in the room, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, really old guys like me <clears throat> and somewhat young guys like Sam, it's, 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 you know, I think having a community of people to do this work yeah, together amen. is important. So one of the things we look at, one of the tools we look at is repetition. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the only tool. It's just one tool. As you guys looked at this text, did you notice any repetitive themes, concepts, words, ideas that are, that are vital to understanding? I mean, hearing, Kathy already mentioned it, but yeah. hearing, I think, is really the star totally. of the show. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not a message about the seed. It's not a message about the sower. I think it's a message about the hearer, yeah. which is embodied in the soils, the different ways of hearing. Um, and in, in the, the light really is just another way of hearing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's another one of the five senses that, that really is saying the same thing, I think. <clears throat> yeah, I'll say, if you look at the, the where it's placed um, in the text, Hearing is at the beginning, the middle, and the end. <clears throat> yeah. So is kingdom of God, which is yeah. interesting. Yes. So we have hearing in verse in verse nine. He who has ears, let him hear. After the first parable, mm-hmm. and then we have in that part the the, the parable about the light. And uh, if anyone has ears, let him hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Mm-hmm. Jesus says in verses twenty three and twenty four. And then in verse thirty three, with many such parables, he spoke to warn them as they were able to hear it. Mm-hmm. So you're right. I think we see hearing at the beginning, the middle, the end, and we see the kingdom of God. Uh, we see in that that kind of inserted teaching in verse uh, eleven, uh, and he said to them, "To you who has uh, been given the secret, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God." He says to yeah, the mm-hmm. disciples, and then we jump down to verse twenty six. The kingdom of God uh, is as if a man should scatter seed, and then in verse thirty, what uh, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Mm-hmm. And so it's like this idea of hearing, yes. uh, so that we can uh, understand what is the kingdom of God and how yep. we're a part of it, and yep. all the other rep- repetitions are mostly just yep. details. I think within the parables, yeah. I think sure. you know you come to the, this text and you need to say not what question do I have and does this answer it. Mm-hmm. You come to the text and you say what is the question this text is telling me to ask. Mm-hmm. And that's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to, to do is ask the right questions. So what is the question that I think this text is answering? It's how does the kingdom break in? Mm-hmm. And the answer mm-hmm. I think is through mm-hmm. preaching. <laughs> it's yeah. through the gospel uh, more than it is through power. Now power accompanies it. It affirms it. It validates it. Jesus came and did the miracles. He did the miraculous. He raised the dead, but he did it in order to primarily in order to credential his mm-hmm. preaching. Jesus was a preacher. Um, and, and, and it's through the preaching of his word, uh, Jesus is the word and he preached the word that the kingdom breaks in. And we see that continued in the book of Acts, that the kingdom expands through, through the truth, through the word. Yeah. It's only after the temptation. The first thing we see, the first thing Jesus does after the temptation 
John kind of offers, I think this is more of like an umbrella statement over the ministry of Jesus, but John in chapter one, verses 14 and 15, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, mm -hmm. yes. saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And so what we see is we can continue to journey through the gospel of Mark as we just see different dimensions of this proclamation ministry of Christ. And it goes, remember that St. Francis of Assisi quote, everyone mm -hmm. always loves to quote, you know, preach the gospel at all times and if absolutely necessary, use words. Yeah. That is, that's my number one, that's a misquote. Yeah. But it's like, the gospel is received yeah. through proclamation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I believe that the Christians ought to embody the gospel in the yeah. way in which yes. it lives? Of course, yes. we ought to love and we ought to care mm -hmm. for the, 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 the sojourner among us and we ought to live the, 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 you know, the attendance of the gospel. But if there's not proclamation yeah. mm -hmm. and there's not hearing, people mm -hmm. aren't going to understand or come to truth of Christ. Yeah. yeah, I want to back up here to just before chapter 3, verse 14, where Jesus is appointing the apostles. What is he appointing them to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Verse 15 to, yeah. to or 14, he says, he appointed the 12 whom he also named apostles. That just means sent, mm -hmm. sent ones, uh, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to what? Preach. To preach. Preach. Yeah. Yeah. preach. Right. Yeah. And have authority to cast out <clears throat> demons. Mm -hmm. uh, notice it doesn't say heal sick people, but he gave them the authority over the demonic realm. Um, and the authority comes in the preaching and the preaching mm -hmm. comes with the authority. And so that's why, you know, it drives me crazy yeah. when I see people up there trying to, um, you know, heal, heal people with arthritis and cast out demons and I don't yeah. hear the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. The power yeah. is for the gospel. Yeah. The spirit came so that the gospel could go out. Yeah. The spirit is the dynamos, the dynamics of the, of the gospel message, mm -hmm. uh, which according to Romans is the power of God to save. Mm -hmm. So Jesus came to model for us the life of a preacher. And, and that's not just for us vocational preachers. That's for every yeah. mm -hmm. ambassador of the kingdom. We are to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's what the power is. Yeah. So for me, this is a text about the importance of preaching and then the importance of of hearing mm -hmm. yeah. because preaching needs to happen. Preaching is going to happen. The light's going to come out. The question is, will you hear it? Will right. you respond to yeah. it? And if you will hear it, then more will be given. And if you don't, then the blasphemy of the Holy spirit things hanging right there right. that you can literally quench the spirit to the point where you don't hear anymore. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is the work of discipleship. <clears throat> The work of discipleship is to raise up and send out men and women who are emboldened and empowered by the Spirit to go out as proclaimers of yeah. the truth. And that doesn't, doesn't have to happen in arenas. It can happen over coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we are, we're, we are to send out disciples to proclaim the gospel. We're not meant, the church isn't meant to be this, this, this giant institution that <clears throat> gathers people under one roof so we can say we have a lot of people under one roof. We are to be a sending agency, <laughs> a sending organization. We are to gather people for the sole purpose of raising them up to maturity that they can be sent out and proclaim the good news just as the first disciples were being sent out to proclaim the good news. Yeah. So that brings us to the, the fifth question on our sheet we always, we always ask each week. How does this text relate to the gospel? How, how do we help people see the gospel in this text? I know it's laced throughout. I'm actually going to step out. I'm going to ask uh, my good friend Mitch Connell to come and sit in the last 30 minutes of our discussion. So Mitch, why don't you come on over? And he's going to start, because Mitch is always great at application. He's great at talking about how these things can come to bear. So I'm going to step out and let him take. For me, you know, I think about preaching this. Um, sometimes we think preaching always has to be telling people what to do, mm -hmm. uh, imperatives. But really for me, powerful preaching is more about declaratives than it is about imperatives. And I can't wait to declare some of these realities mm -hmm. of what the kingdom of God both was, is, and will be in its specificity. Mm -hmm. uh, the kingdom expands. That's mm -hmm. exciting. The yeah. kingdom grows when you're sleeping. That's exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you think it's not happening and you, you know, I mean, how many books do we read about how to synthesize the kingdom growth? And in reality, it happens when you're sleeping. It happens when you go to bed. That's an exciting preachable truth. Um, the fact that, <clears throat> that there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of warning in this passage. There's a lot of warning to the different soils that are not you know, not willing to accept or, or that accepted immediately. And then instantly are choked out by the cares of this world. That one to me is like, ding America. Right. right. Well, like yeah. sweet Jesus. Great. He, <clears throat> you know, he likes me. Great. So I like me too. Uh, let's I'll be a Christian. That's cool. But man, can I have my stuff? Can I have my comfort? Can I have my life? Can I have my politics? Can I have my whatever? Can I have my RV? Can I have my retirement? Can I have all that too? And that stuff just chokes out the gospel. So there's a tone of warning. There's a tone of declare declaration. I think of just the reality of the kingdom. Uh, in all of its attributes that come in. There's a lot here, I think, that can be preached. For sure. Yeah, he asked specifically, too, about how it relates to the message of the gospel. And um, I, and I, I think what we're seeing here is that the kingdom Jesus is building is filled with people uh, who hear who Jesus is, who ultimately trust him as king, and, su and submit to him and grow in obedience, who bear fruit, mm -hmm. And then they share their lives with others. That's kind of the, the point of multiplication. And, mm -hmm. 
And although that feel that feels in some ways like a, a, a nail that's been hammered to death, uh, it is the central reality of how the kingdom has continued to grow and prosper mm -hmm. from from uh, a group of twelve disciples until the present day, where we have you know two billion people mm -hmm. who are who are following Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think there's some also some side application there that is at least interesting to to think through, and that is the conditions of the heart and the soils. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the hard heart, which is the pathway, <sighs> the shallow heart. Um, which has the, the rocks in it, and the crowded heart, which it has competing seeds, mm, I like that. and then the fruitful heart. And mm. uh, each, each soil really has some specific work that needs to happen in order for it to be able to receive the kingdom. The hard heart needs to be plowed up. There, there needs to be some disruption that breaks open the surface of the soil so that the seed can be planted in. The shallow heart needs to, it says in the text there that I think is really interesting, it says that the, uh, they immediately receive the word of God with joy, right? So it's an emotional response, but it never goes below the surface. And because there's no root in it, whenever trials come, it, it's scorched. And so I think there's uh, something for the shallow heart to consider, which is move beyond emotion. This is not just about meeting the needs of your flesh, right? And then uh, the crowded heart must move beyond uh, and, and remove competing values, competing seeds. The mm -hmm. kingdom has to be primary mm -hmm. in their lives. Uh, and, and what's very interesting, too, is that you see that there's a parallel between the three enemies of the believer, which is uh, in the first one, the devil steals away uh, the seeds. And then in the second one, receiving with joy is just a fleshly emotional response to the word of the kingdom. Um, and so you have the devil, the flesh. And then the last one, you have the world with its competing values pulling at the heart of the individual and choking out the life of the word of God so it becomes unfruitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah that's really good. <clears throat> <clears throat> I like the idea of plowing and just, just thinking, you know, I talked to as a pastor, I talked to a lot of people that, that are just concerned for the salvation of their loved ones, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. for their kids, for their sisters, for their friends. And, and, uh, and we almost ironically always pray the same thing for them or plow them, mm -hmm. like plow them, like just mm -hmm. break up the, 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 the ground that is, that is yeah. inhibiting the gospel from having entrance. Um, and it's weird to pray that for somebody, mm -hmm. but it's like, hit them as hard as you got to hit them yeah. to right. break up that soil. Because the reality is, um, this, the, the gospel is not going to penetrate and it's yeah. through brokenness often yeah. and through suffering and through tribulation mm -hmm. that God actually tills the soil yeah. of people's hearts. And it's not until people often hit rock bottom where they come to the yeah. end of themselves that gospel can gain entrance and, mm -hmm. uh, and begin to grow. Yeah. So true. And that's one of the problems I think about our our context we are that shallow soil mm -hmm. where it's really convenient to receive the gospel mm -hmm. but there is no depth and that's what tribulation that's what suffering that's what persecution does yeah. is it reveals the depth of the soil and we do i mean we, we've gotten in the west we've gotten really good at making converts and really bad at making disciples yeah you know um i, I was listening to some podcast the other day the guy's talking about iran and, and christians in iran and, mm -hmm. and how they had this mass revival but then as soon as persecution started these christians started to walk away from their faith mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's going i'm just i was confused by this i thought that it was the blood of the martyrs the seed of the church i thought yeah. persecution activates the growth of the church and then he's like i realized in that moment that uh, we weren't making disciples. We were making converts. Yeah. Mm. Disciples, when they're pressed, they grow. Yeah. Disciples, when they're persecuted, yeah. they they um, they become refined. Mm -hmm. Converts or supposed converts, they get burned out. They don't. Yeah. They get burned up. They they yeah. they don't have the root system. You know, there. And clearly, Jesus, I think, is talking about the crowds yeah. that that are all around yeah. him that are really intrigued by what he's doing. Totally. Yeah. And they're excited about this this guy who's running around healing people. Yep. But there's no root system. Yeah. Right. Well, and in the, the other synoptic gospels, he makes clear that he's the sower yeah. bringing the kingdom yeah. message. And so he, he, there's direct specific mm -hmm. application to the crowds that, that are following him around. Mitch, make it good, man. Paul made it sound <laughs> like you were going to just come up here and drop some. <laughs> <laughs> I've let down a lot of people before <laughs> and today's going to be <laughs> another one of those. <laughs> what are your thoughts, man? Dude, I don't know, man. I'm just listening. All right, next. Have some questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, honestly, as you were talking, Jeremy, about kind of those the three different things, like how do we uh, till up or plow mm -hmm. the, the shallow heart? 
how do we remove competing values? Mm -hmm. Uh, How do we move beyond emotion? I think my question is what do those things look like practically? Mm -hmm. Right. And and then I'll get into that like homiletical side of things, but um, yeah, what's our hope for plowing up that shallow heart? What's how, how is, how does a Christian move beyond emotion and and how does a Christian grow roots? And Mm. I know you're saying discipleship, Mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of people are still going to walk away with those and be like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like I want to grow deeper roots. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? Oh yeah. I feel like I'm shallow. How do I do it? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, a question that I've always wrestled with is man, when I, I see myself in this parable, I'm like, oh man, I could be so deceived mm-hmm. by riches or whatever it is come for. It's just like, it's easy for that seed to get choked out in my life by the cares of this world. And so I'm often asking, mm-hmm. how do I, how, how do I remove competing values from my life without ultimately chopping out everything that's fun and desirable <laughs> in this life until I'm sitting in a blank room with yeah. just my Bible wondering yeah. what I'm right. supposed to do with yeah. my time. Yeah. Those yeah. are good questions. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, they are good things to think through. It's one of those texts though, where it's like, that's not really the point Jesus is getting at too. He's like, he doesn't really say, mm-hmm. he just, he just says, this is what it is. This is my observation. He's giving, he's giving some clarity into the reality of why mm-hmm. people don't receive, you know, but yeah, it's our job as the expositor. It's our job as the, as the pastor or as the preacher to go, okay, how do we, change that what yeah. you know what what does it look like to change that and we could probably go through each of these you know i think jeremy you did a good job of that i liked mm-hmm. your 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 walk through there of each of these demand a different there's a there's a um there's a, a prescription for each of these you know um one of them i didn't know if you mentioned the, the birds of the air mm-hmm. you know it's like that 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 didn't even have a chance and satan is 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 present in this moment actively ready to just snatch away mm-hmm. the gospel which is an element that that we have to think about when we're doing evangelism that this mm-hmm. Satan is right there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the demonic realm is, is so apparent in Mark's writing. Yeah. Um, it's all over the place. He, he brings it up all the time. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's another and Paul and I were in this last week, we were talking about, uh, the fact that I, I was just confessing, like, I just <clears throat> don't, I just don't have that at the forefront of my mind mm-hmm. so much of the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think I forget even though I know cognitively, I forget that Satan's goal is not just to make me uncomfortable mm-hmm. or to, you know, make my life unpleasant in some way. His actual goal is is to leave me hopeless, bereft of faith, uh, to, to leave me so utterly destitute spiritually and emotionally that I eventually join him, abandon my hope in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, he has an eternal scheme. He's a murderer. Mm-hmm. right and a liar and he's been that way since the very beginning and and uh, i i think you're right man there, there's a an element of spiritual warfare in preaching that we mm-hmm. we oftentimes are not not really considering or thinking about that while we are casting the seeds of the kingdom mm-hmm. along with <clears throat> jesus in 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 this example here that there is actual warfare happening over the hearts and minds of people so i think you know maybe one application that you might bring out of that like how do how do we break up the the fallow ground of the heart uh i I would say one we pray to god that he defeats the enemy and beats back the birds of the air and that he opens up the soil of people's hearts because uh, we need his intervention in this there's we can't fight that in in the strength of our flesh Yeah, good. I actually love I love how little imperative really is on the mm-hmm. believer in this passage. Yeah. It's really like if Jesus is the <clears throat> sower, yep. and Jesus is the one. God's the one allowing things to grow while you're sleeping, mm-hmm. and uh, you know what I mean. And the truth is going to go out regardless. Right. So you stick it under bed; it's going to catch the bed on fire. Yeah. It's actually kind of cool. Like it, there's really not a lot here for us to say as believers, at least, you know, um, there's not a ton of imperative here. It's really like, this is what's happening. Right. Um, some people descriptive rather than prescriptive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's okay to preach it that way. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of sermons about what to do. Um, and there's certainly, there's, there's a warning in this, but you know, some people preach this and they go, well, it really, um, I've heard people say this, like the, the, the one throwing the seed should have been more careful. Oh yeah. (laughs) Right. Like, so you, you know, here's, here's the plow. Uh, and, and, and you should be putting it in there. And this is a parable about don't yeah. just, don't just, I'm like, I think it's completely the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. The point is you don't know 
what the soil is. Yeah. And it does seem kind of like the guy's careless I and mean, he's just chucking it out mm-hmm. there. Right. But but the reality is that's that's all we can do. Yeah. We, we preach to everybody. We don't know what the soil is, you know. Um, so unless you're a Calvinist and you, you have God's <laughs> secret book and you know who the elect are, you just spread it to everybody, right? Yeah, I love that too. Going back to kind of your earlier discussion that I was sidelined for about preaching, um, that's such a comfort to the preacher, mm-hmm. right? Because, and we all know, like in different seasons, whether it be uh, ministry or with friends or youth ministry, whatever it is, that sometimes you preach mm-hmm. and you don't feel like you're gaining any ground. Yeah. You don't see it working. Uh, but just to sit back and know, as you were saying earlier, that the gospel is the power of God unto yes. salvation. Yeah. And this is what we're to do is to preach yeah. these truths regardless of what we see happening yes. around us, I'm with you. I'm just going to keep scattering, mm. scattering seed. And I think for me, like in our high school ministry right now, it's actually a huge blessing. We have a lot of kids coming that don't claim to know Jesus whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a, it's a blessing in that uh, I know that I have a job to do, yeah. and it's not, it's not up to me to be crafty with my wisdom. Mm-hmm. It's not up to me to try to devise a way that I can trick them in to believe it's like nope i have some seat and i'm just gonna keep throwing it out there Mm. and throwing it out there and uh also knowing that too with with confidence that this kingdom isn't gonna shrink Mm -hmm. like you've been saying like the Mm -hmm. kingdom is gonna expand it is gonna grow through the preaching Mm -hmm. of the word um that's it's kind of cool because preaching you may not see what it's doing at times uh, but you know that the spirit's at work you know Mm -hmm. that the kingdom's gonna grow and you know that god's ultimately gonna going to do things in the hearts of people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. You're preaching from a place of, of knowing that there's a victory coming, which is pretty awesome. You think that might be why Paul was able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I I, I don't feel embarrassed about it because he's saying it is the power of God unto salvation. Like this message is what is saving people. I don't, I don't even really, it's not me persuading them. (laughs) Right. It matter of fact, he says in Corinth uh, to the Corinthian church, like uh, the the preaching of our message sounds like foolishness yeah. to the rest of the world. I mean, and if you think about the reality of the Christian message, yeah. at its core are some things that are very hard to wrap your mind around. A guy two thousand years ago died on a cross, was raised from the dead. He launched off the Mount of Olives up to a throne in a heavenly kingdom, and one day he's coming back. Like. You sound like a, a nut job UFO conspiracy theorist. <laughs> flat Earth. <laughs> or a flat earther when you say those things in a modern context. And there's a supernatural element uh, to the message of the kingdom in that you see it actually changes lives when people put their hope in it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One of my favorite parts of this that, that I think is comforting to me is verse 33. And it says, with many such parables, he spoke <clears throat> the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own mm-hmm. disciples, mm-hmm. he explained everything. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's such a, you know, I know we're, we're not supposed to use the word, but intimacy. It's like he, he reserved this special revelation mm-hmm. for his disciples. And I just think about like, you know, my kids, like I love, get a, just love explaining things to my kids mm-hmm. and I'm going to take the time to unpack things sure. to my kids that I wouldn't maybe to someone else's kids. Or I think about like my wife, I just, I, I, I'd share things from my soul mm-hmm. with my wife that I mm-hmm. wouldn't share with anybody else. I mean, we just mm-hmm. have that special revelation. I love that Jesus kindly yeah. takes the time mm-hmm. to unpack these parables. And, uh, and it's kind of cool to think about that when you're reading the apostles, write their epistles. Mm-hmm that these guys had special instruction mm-hmm. when they were in the house. Yeah. You know, I love that picture of in the house, outside the mm-hmm. house. Outside the house, you got crowds, you got people like yeah. so crazy that Jesus has to have a boat on standby yeah. just in case he gets crushed. But then in the house, you got Jesus mm-hmm. sitting with his disciples, just taking the time mm-hmm. to unpack things, letting them ask questions, you know, just the kindness of Christ to reveal. And, and, and I love that we have that. We have Jesus as our intercessor always there through his word by the spirit mm-hmm. to just explain things to mm-hmm. us. Say, Lord, I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me? And of course he will. Maybe not right then, but at some point. Mm-hmm. Other thoughts? Or should we wrap it up? <clears throat> Last chance. I think one of the things that I, I was just contemplating this morning was um, the, re- the reality also of the Holy Spirit in this. Because right before this passage, you have this, this idea of blaspheme in the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And then when he gets to the section where he's talking about light, right, and, and how it's, it's meant to be shared, 
And the role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of all things that Jesus had, had taught. It was, that was part of the reason for the Holy Spirit. It was to give them power to be witnesses, to share what light they had received. So that they might act like a city on a hill, that they might be the salt of the earth, that they might be the, the mm-hmm. flavor of Christ in the world. And um, I, I, I remember a while ago having a discussion where... Um, where uh, somebody made this statement, you know, if you if if you don't see the necessity of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's probably because you aren't living in such a way that you actually need Him. Mm-hmm. And I and I think one of the reasons that the, the Holy Spirit gets diminished in in church circles is that the truth of the, of the matter is is that there are many who are who are receiving lots of revelation from God, but there is no direct application. Mm-hmm. To to sharing that with others and and translating that truth, I think of my my son right now in Phoenix. He's at a, a trade school. And Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, right. Arizona. Not Phoenix, <laughs> Oregon. Right. <coughs> Big difference. Uh, he hated school all all through his high school years. He just absolutely despised it. And and then he he's going to this you know uh, mechanic school. And now he has a a book lesson and then videos to watch. And then there's a lab that directly follows. And so what he's learning, he immediately puts into use in the lab. Mm. And he loves it. He's a straight-A student right now, well, for three months. So, <laughs> But for <laughs> the first continues. time in his life, mm-hmm. he is, he's a straight-A student because he sees mm-hmm. the necessity yes. yeah. of the information. And I think, man, when, when we are in a position of constantly talking about the kingdom and living for the values of the kingdom... There, there is an immediate need mm-hmm. um, that to to recognizing the role of the Holy Spirit in our That's lives, so true. and the reality of how important this truth yeah. actually yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. and I, th- I was thinking too that we have this life giving message, and mm. it shouldn't be hidden. Yeah. We have this responsibility, I think, as believers to to let it shine, to yeah. let those words come out, to speak into other people's lives. It's a purpose. I mean, we, that's our purpose. That's right. Let's <laughs> sing it, Sam. Yeah, yeah totally. Amen. I just, like, I, my mind goes to wartime uh, a little bit here mm-hmm. and just imagining, like, people during World War II that were in places where they weren't allowed to have radios. Oh, yeah. Or imagine you're in a prison camp, you know, in, in Germany or in Japan, and you just want to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you'd give anything to like mm-hmm. build some kind of makeshift radio and hide it in your wall. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and for those who are, for those that are um, excited about the coming of the kingdom of Christ, mm-hmm. the news of it is mm-hmm. such good news. Mm-hmm. And really what Jesus is doing here in parables is he's, he's broadcasting mm-hmm. the entrance of the kingdom mm-hmm. and the yeah. king. And for those who are part of that kingdom, mm-hmm. those who are the subjects of the king, yeah, that's good news. Yeah. And, and they want to hear more. Turn on the radio, right? right. And when, when we care about the coming of the king, then we open the book that mm-hmm. talks about his coming. Amen. You know. Cool, guys. Well, I hope this is encouraging for those listening. If you've made it all the way to this <laughs> point, uh, you've proved all the statistics wrong, about 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 second attention spans. Uh, I would just encourage anyone listening that, you know, uh, we're, <clears throat> not, we're not experts. Jeremy is. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But and Kathy. I have a high school diploma. Um, no, we're not experts. You know, we don't know what we're talking about. But the reality is, is that opening the Bible in community is a very, very, very cool thing. Yeah. And I think the, the idea of, of community exposition or community exegesis yeah. is something I think the church as a whole needs to press into more. Yeah. You can do this. Um, yeah. You can sit down with your friends, open a passage, all read it for the first time, mm-hmm. ask questions, talk mm-hmm. about it, come up with, it doesn't have to be like, how would you preach it? But right. what's the point of it? How does it apply? I mean, this is something at Philippi now, and you guys at Heritage, you encourage all the time, just sit down, Bible's open, let's talk about it, let's have a discussion. You know, back in the day, not everybody had their own Bible. Mm -hmm. You had to go to the synagogue, and you had to read scripture, and you'd have discussion in the synagogue, and it wasn't really for quite a while, just everyone had their own Bible in print. So I would just encourage anyone listening, like, this is something that every Christian should practice. Mm -hmm. It's a discipline of community interpretation of the scripture, and putting heads together, and you know, you don't know everything. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, and when you come uh, hear other people's thoughts and other people's questions, it's really, really good. So uh, I'm going to pray and we'll just close out. And uh, Father, thank you so much for this time and for uh, the two churches, Philippi and Heritage, um, being able to come together and continue to preach uh, Lord, together, um, thinking of these passages together. I pray for everyone tuned in, listening right now, Lord, that they might be encouraged and inspired to open their Bibles with other believers and to hear from you. 